Well, David, I'm glad to see you again. Good to see uh, you. You, uh, a few minutes ago, you mentioned uh, the word acceptance in the sense of accepting the uh, the interior unwholesome thoughts. Yeah. 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 That's that's a very very typical mistake that's made in the West. Generally, if, uh, if we're going to think about acceptance, that means to accept the outside world or to accept what's coming in to us through our senses, and that we put up with the outside world. Uh, we can't do that if we have unwholesome thoughts because the unwholesome thoughts will be to not accept what's on the outside world. So if you have the idea that, oh, I have to accept my own unwholesome thoughts, now you're going in, in two different, going in, in the wrong direction in two different ways. Because uh, by continuing to allow the unwholesome thoughts in the mind and, ex and accepting that, you're in dukkha. And then when um, uh, something happens from the outside and uh, you don't accept it, that's just more dukkha. But when we change it around to recognize that, oh, the outside world is not my problem. I can't fix it. That's not the, world, that's not the work to do. The real work to do or the, uh, the one's right effort is to take what's in the mind and to change that into something wholesome so that then with that wholesome, we can actually then accept what's coming in from the outside world. Okay. Okay. But this is a common mistake that, that students make. And I think that, that it has to do with um, the concept of noting. I've heard of that before. Okay. Noting versus noticing, right? Uh... Yeah, technically, uh, it doesn't matter which words we use if we don't define them correctly. Uh, there is a phrase that I had heard many, many years ago. I think I'd probably heard this before I'd ever heard of that Mahasi. And that was to note it well and to let it pass. Now, that's different. Noting it well and letting it pass is completely different than... Uh, noting and noting and noting and noting. Yeah. Uh, that in fact, noting it well and letting it pass is absolutely wholesome to let that stuff go, to turn it loose, to change the mind from that to something else. And then in fact, when we are caught in, uh, let us say, an unwholesome thought, then we are in that unwholesome thought. But when we catch it in the sense of recognizing that it's an unwholesome thought, that's a new thought. Yes. Okay. We actually come out of that thought and have a new thought about the thought, the thought that we just had. That shows that, in fact, the mind is... Uh, Freud calls it uh, free association. And a lot of people think that once they get their mind stuck on something, that it's really hard to get it off. And that's not true. It really is very easy to get the mind off of whatever we were thinking about. But it's also very easy for the mind to come right back to it. Right. And so we have to know the distinction between uh, being, let us say, uh, ground in to a certain pattern of thought versus the fact that, no, we can come out of that. And if we can come out of it, even if we go back into it, we can still come back out of it again. That this is the real training, is to not um, try uh, to completely eliminate a thought as if, oh, that's an unwholesome thought, and now I'm, I'm making the strong determination I'll never have that thought again. Because the thought will come again. And when yeah. it does, yeah. it will feel bad. It doesn't work to just, you can't will your thoughts. It, um, 
what I've always tried to do is just bring my attention. Not to yet. Me. Excuse you me. You don't have the skills. And that's what this is all about is to develop the skills of having the thoughts that you want to have and to not have the thoughts that are unwholesome. So um, we can also understand it from the perspective that when the unwholesome thought is seen and removed, that's a relief. That's a relief. That's that's uh, 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 completing a task. It's like um, carrying around a huge backpack all day because you're out traveling or something, and then you finally set it down. What a relief it is to put that big heavy backpack down, to set it down and take the burden off. This is um, the way that the Buddha approaches it. Uh, when he's talking about the five hindrances, there are five um, analogies, and these five analogies work with the five hindrances, but you wouldn't say that one analogy uh, is for each individual hindrance. This analogy for that hindrance, this analogy for this hindrance, etc. But rather to think of the analogies are interrelated and that more than one analogy will fit for more than one of the hindrances. And so what it does is it tends to draw the hindrances together to realize that the hindrances are just hindrances and that all of them have the same um, commonality that we can see through these five uh, analogies. So the first analogy is, is being sick let us say, in the hospital. Right? And uh, when, uh, when you go to the hospital because you're sick, you want to be in the hospital, you want to be taken care of. But then in the hospital, everybody gets the idea that, hey, wait a minute, I'm okay now, I want out of here. Right. Everybody wants out of the hospital. And generally, from the time that the doctor says that, okay, you can go, let me go get the paperwork, until the time you actually walk out of the hospital, is an extraordinarily long period of time. Hours sometimes, or a uh, minute, but whatever. You're really wanting to go. You yeah, feel yeah. better. So no, That's happened to me before. Right. When you're sick, you want to be in the hospital, but when you get better, you want out of there. This is also the same thing with the hindrances, is that the hindrances make us sick. But when we get free from the hindrances, it's very much like getting over an illness, and now we're, we're ready to get out of here. We don't want to be in the hospital anymore. Okay? So that's the first analogy. The second analogy is surprisingly similar in the sense of prison, that a prisoner is in prison and he's got a long sentence and he sees no uh, escape and all of the uh, legal work is a drudgery and everything. And then all of a sudden something happens and he's sprung from jail. Maybe the president gives amnesty or a pardon or something and now he's out of jail. And so imagine the feeling of being set free after spending months and months or years in prison. Right. Okay. The next analogy is the analogy of uh, being a servant or being employed. In the example, the, the servant has to get up before the king, has to, uh, to dress himself, and then he has to dress the king and feed the king and follow the king around all day to make sure that the king has what he wants. And then he dresses the king for bed and puts the king to bed, and only after that can now the servant rest. <coughs> and then imagine that the king fires him. Wow, what a relief it is. Now I don't have to get up at six in the morning and work until nine. That I have freedom finally. I can go and do what I want. Well, you can see how all three of these have a certain kind of undertone uh, or a thread to them. Well, yeah, desire. 
Right, that you want to be out of this. Yeah, it should be different out of it. here and now. Uh-huh. And so the fourth one then is the analogy of being in debt, that you owe somebody something. Mm-hmm. And then you get it paid off. And what a relief that is. Have you ever been in debt and then paid it off? Uh, yes. Yeah, and it feels like a relief, doesn't it? Wow, you don't have to do that one anymore. Don't have to worry about that hanging over the head anymore. Exactly. Well, that's similar to, in fact, having the work to do to take care of the king. Like the servant has debts to pay, and so he's got to work. Right. And if he doesn't pay the debts, he's going to go to jail. Or worse still, if he owes the money to the wrong guy, he's going to wind up in the hospital. Right. Okay, so you can see how all of these things fit together. The next one and the last one is uh, the analogy of being on a journey with all of your baggage. Uh Uh-huh. That's why I brought up the issue of the backpack. Because um, when we're out on a journey, we have to watch our baggage. Uh, If we're carrying more than one bag, then we have to be very special, careful about them. Because uh, let us say if we have to go to the bus ticket counter or whatever, we've got to manage that baggage while we're getting the ticket. That's one of the reasons why ticket counters are so uh, crowded is because everybody's got their baggage there with them. They can't set it over there in the corner. Baggage will walk off. Well, yeah. So we, yeah. Right. Need somebody so we have to, you have to, all right. And that's one of the good reasons for people to travel in groups. Except now, instead of looking for your baggage, you've got everybody's baggage to take care of and all of those people, too. So when you get home, finally, you just set all of that baggage down and relax. Very, very few people, the first thing they do when they arrive home is unpack their bags. Nobody does that. Sometimes bags don't get unpacked for days or weeks. They want to be finished with it, right? And so now we have these five analogies, and all five of them with the hindrances have the quality of relief. The relief of having those kind of thoughts out of the mind. Okay, I got you. So the payoff is the relief. The, right, the trade-off is the release. I don't have to think about that anymore. Like that conversation that I was having with Billy Bob in my own mind, because I'll probably see him tomorrow, and there's all of the stuff that we've got to straighten out, right? And so here I go in my mind with Billy Bob and Billy Bob and Billy Bob, and then I can say, wait a minute, Billy Bob is not here right now. I don't have to deal with Billy Bob right now. Why am I dealing with him right now in my mind? Why can't I just be happy for a minute? Just relax, take a deep breath, and not have to deal with Billy Bob or actually anything in the future. That we need to get into the state of being able to say, I'll deal with it later. That's not to be dealt with now. That future event, the future, let the future take care of itself. Let the past be done. Because you're not who you were in the past. You're something new now. And so just letting the past go and let the future go. Um, and, and to have wholesome thoughts that are wholesome because they're uh, about the right now, the here now. Okay. Generally, when we feel afraid or dangerous, uh, that's because of something that we're thinking about that might happen or something happened that was a close call or something like that in the past. But in this present moment, everything is safe. You really are safe right now. I mean, look around. There's no alligators on the room. I don't see a big snake on your bed. The dog is not being eaten by a bear right now. Everything is okay. It is. And so this is part of what we need to do is to look around to recognize with wisdom that we really are safe right now, that there really is nothing to do and no place to go and everything that needed to be done is done. And so we need to actually practice doing that. Last time we discussed triggers, um, Mm -hmm. 
I have been having a difficult time when, because there have been a lot of those lately, and when I've been susceptible because I've been tired. I find myself reacting. Um, is it just a matter of <laughs> practice, a matter of repetition, that eventually when that when the really strong ones happen, you can see right through them? I will tell you what. Let's add some new triggers. Okay. Every time you use the word tired, let that even uh, verbally or mentally, every time you think of being tired, any time that anything has to do with tired, that's going to be a trigger for you to take a deep breath. All right. Okay. Whenever you think tired, it says, okay, I don't have to feel tired. I can take a deep breath and start clean out some of the uh, the tired juice that's in the blood, let that old carbon dioxide out, and let the uh, the body breathe in more oxygen so that the body and the brain becomes more oxygenated, so that you won't feel so tired. That everybody feels tired. A lot of people, in fact, I would say that the older people get, the more tired they are waking up in the morning. And part of the reason why we, we wake up tired in the morning is because in the night we haven't been getting all the breathing, all the air that we could use. This is why the Buddha would recommend that we sleep on the side rather than on the back. In fact, uh, uh, in COVID, when it first happened, they were losing so many people were dying or putting them on respirators and not coming off. And they found out the problem was, is that people were laying on their back, which meant that the lower part of the lung systems were being collapsed by the beds. And so they couldn't breathe anyway. And so I they tried a, to a CPAP machine, which keeps my airway open. Uh -huh. It blows. It's like a constant pressure device. So um, my sleep issues are related to a physiological problem that I'm working on. So. Oh, all right. Well, let's start with that then right now. Let's start working with your posture in bed to start sleeping on your side. If you sleep on your stomach and your chest, then the whole weight of the body is preventing you from being able to breathe. If you sleep on your back, then the lower part of the lungs don't get um, open at all. But if you sleep on your side, either on the left or the right side, then that lets uh, uh, the rib cage uh, flow easily on your side. So um, the way to practice this is uh, to just remember when you're laying in bed at night to sleep on, to lay down on your side. Every time you can remember and, and check your posture because most people, they're not paying any attention much at all to the posture of the body when they're in bed. So. Okay. Uh, start to paying attention to the posture to keep bringing the body back into uh, uh, sleeping on the side or, or laying on the side. Now, whether or not your knees are bent in, up into the fetal position or whether they're straight out or any in between is not the issue. The really important issue is that you're sleeping on the side and that you're remembering to put the body into that posture. So you're doing two good things. Throughout the night, if you remember to readjust your posture, then you're going to be breathing better, but also that little bit of mindfulness to wake up and recognize that you're not in the posture that you want to be in. And so it's part of the practice of waking up, of checking your posture. If you, and, um, is while we're talking about that, we can also talk about the preparation for going to sleep at night. And one of those would be that uh, a lot of people have um, the situation when they go to bed, they, they have the idea that, oh, well, I've got stuff to do tomorrow and I've got to get some sleep. Right. This is this attitude is unwholesome. You can hear the unwholesomeness in the, in the words that I used. A much more wholesome way of going to sleep is with the mindfully having the thoughts of, wow, this is nice. 
got no place to go and nothing to do for eight hours. I can just lay here and have a ball. You hear the wholesomeness in that. So we begin to have wholesome thoughts. Everything's going to be all right. I'm going to get all the rest I need. How nice this is. You can snuggle up under the covers and say, oh, this feels so good. You're not convinced. <laughs> I, I've been having sleeping problems for years, and um, I know what's causing it. But it takes time for me to get back to where I need to get to. It's a hormonal problem. I'm on, uh, let's just say, supplemental hormones prescribed by a doctor. Okay. And things get out of whack. My sleep gets really bad, and I... I use the word tired, but like I, my patience gets really thin. I, uh, today I've been more emotional. Like it's just, it, there's a lot of factors involved. Like I feel terrible right now. All of those factors though have to do with unwholesome thought. Agreed. That if, if you were having wholesome thoughts most, much more of the time, you probably wouldn't feel the way that you feel. Agreed. Irritable and uh, 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 patience. But if you were having wholesome thoughts, then wholesome thoughts, you could be patient. So uh, this is an important point, is that uh, the, the kind of statements that you're making um, sounds like that... <clears throat> trying to be careful here. I don't want to step on anybody's toes. <laughs> it sounds like that you're um, that you're feeling kind of overwhelmed or that you've got a lot of work to do or that this is a big issue, things like that, which basically put us into the, <clears throat> the feeling of this is hard or this is difficult. And that, that is a associative attitude with uh, uh, that things are stronger than you are, putting that's us what, into the position of being feels, a victim that's what to our feels. own. Mm. You're saying guilty? Yes, that's what it feels like. Okay, so over. you feel so you feel guilty for uh, or even shame for not being able to do uh, what you think that you ought to be able to do. That's and it. so you're a victim to something. You're yeah. being victimized. Okay. This is an attitude that we can begin to change. And so while I was talking about laying in bed at night, the victim is the one who, oh, I've got to get to sleep. Oh, I've got so much work to do. To where the winner's position is, wow, I've got no place to go and nothing to do for the next eight hours. I could just lay here and just enjoy. If you take a few deep breaths and just enjoy the night, because I got no pressures, no worries, nothing to do. There's nobody going to break into the house and put me in front of the computer screen and whack me until I type. Yeah, that's true. But every, that is true. That's that's not what I'm upset though. <laughs> but I, I, get, I said that's not what I'm upset though. I, but I get the point. I get. I get the point you're making. I, well, you'd, you'd be surprised that even then, even when you're ready to get into bed, we still tell ourselves upsetting kinds of things, work to do and whatnot like that, rather than finally giving ourselves peace and quiet and rest. Okay. All right. And and so uh, the, then throughout the night we're going to maintain that we keep getting back into this to the laying on the side and this will take some training it takes long training to be able to sleep on the side because the body's habit is to end the irritation and you'll change postures without even waking up through the night and so people you've probably seen high-speed film of people sleeping for hours and they're just tossing and turning and rolling all over the place. Or if you sleep, sleep with a child, a child is just all over the bed. I'm surprised that children even stay in beds. I guess that's why they put bars around beds for really young kids. Right. Okay. 
So we're all over the place, uh, uh, unconsciously or subconsciously. And so beginning to pay attention to what posture we're in keeps bringing us back into the present moment. And you, you will find it, in fact, um, basically what dreams are about in general. Some people will argue that occasionally there are some dreams that are wholesome, but generally dreams themselves are unwholesome. <clears throat> Dream about which you mean, last night. <laughs> which means that if we're having unwholesome thoughts as we're going to sleep, those same old unwholesome thoughts will just continue on as we're uh, going into sleep. But if we start intentionally as we're going to sleep to have wholesome thoughts, then there's not much to dream about. Okay. Okay. That's and true. And so... Uh, practicing Anapanasati uh, before and during going to bed and and while you're laying there in bed is, is a good time to practice. Okay. Uh, that uh, this practice doesn't have to be done sitting on the floor in meditation style the way that the Westerners have that actually we need to be able to practice in all the postures. And so now that you're mentioning that you've got sleep issues and whatnot, the right way to handle them is by beginning more and more to substitute unwholesome thoughts with wholesome thoughts. And to make sure that you are uh, gaining the benefit of removing those unwholesome thoughts and, and having wholesome thoughts. So let me give you a story of, of the Buddha. Uh, this is in Sutta number 19. It's a very interesting story. He's talking about a cow herd. And the cow herd has to take the cows uh, down, a, down a trail or down a path. And this is a trail or a path that's inhabited. And so you've got stalls and you've got people and you've got kids and all kinds of stuff. So while the, the cow herd is taking his cows down this path, he has to use a stick to whack the cow to keep the cow on the path because the cows will just roam anywhere and they can step on a child or bust into a, a food stall or take food off the, the stall, any kind of things. And so the goat, the uh, cow herd, has to be very mindful. But uh, the issue is not that he has to hit them with a stick to get them to go, but rather that he knows that if he doesn't hit the stick, hit them with the stick, that they can go off and go do something that's damaging or dangerous. That if his cow steps on a child, then the authorities are going to come in. Or if one of his cows knocks over a food stall, he's going to have to pay for that. And if it's a wealthy man, he could wind up in whatever version of a hospital that this guy has, right? Right. <laughs> and so we have to be careful to keep the cows in line. Now, this is actually the practice of the brand new beginner. The brand new beginner, because the cows are likely to go into unwholesome territory all the time, and we're not even watching them. So now we're going to be watching the cows to make sure that they don't tread off the path and, and go astray into unwholesome thoughts causing damage. However, once we get practicing well, that's the analogy is when the, the, the cows are now out in the pasture where he's taken them on the road. Uh, to a place where they've already uh, uh, gathered the rice and there's rice uh, stalks and stubble uh, out there for the cows to eat. And so now the, the cow herd doesn't have to stand there with his stick right there with the cows. He can go sit down under a tree. And all he has to do is uh, to monitor to say, yeah, there's the cows. Yeah, there they are. I can see them. Okay, and so um, this is actually more relaxed. So we're actually going from one relaxed state to the lower, to more relaxed, to more relaxed, to more relaxed. When we're not guarding the mind, when we're not watching where the cows are, then they're all over the place causing damage. Like having those thoughts of 
that conversation over and over and over again. It's not a relaxing uh, way of, of living one's life, is always thinking about the past and the future. And so we begin to monitor that as often as we can remember to do it all day long, not just in the sitting, but the sitting will help this a lot. If we continue to focus on having just wholesome thoughts and we've got nothing else to distract us, then we can practice better. This is the reason for the, uh, the secluded practice is to get into the habit of having wholesome thoughts, more wholesome thoughts and more wholesome thoughts. But then we need to monitor that all the time. And when we get to the point where we have wholesome thoughts all the time, then it's not so much work at all. So the, the most work is not monitoring the mind. And then we begin to uh, monitor the mind, but then we recognize that that's a lot of work too, to throw out unwholesome thoughts and keep throwing them out. But eventually we get down to the point to where it's all wholesome thoughts. And now that there are all wholesome thoughts, the uh, cow herd can sit under the tree and rest. But there's even more than that, and that is, is that once we recognize that all of our thoughts are wholesome, now we don't even need to have so many of them. We can begin to put some space between the thoughts so that there's a wholesome thought and then silence. Yeah. Then another wholesome thought and then silence. And pretty soon we have a lot of silence and a whole lot fewer wholesome thoughts. But unwholesome thoughts, once the unwholesome thought comes in, it's very difficult to bring the silence back that the silence has to be done through the wholesome, not through the unwholesome. Right. <clears throat> and so that uh, this is the, the way that we practice uh, for the Anapanasati, is to continue to bring back wholesome thoughts. And we uh, have to do an investigation to figure out what's wholesome and what's not wholesome. So the easy way to do it is to recognize that if this thought is pleasant, pleasing, and happening right here, right now, that this is what's happening right here, right now, then that more than likely is going to be a wholesome thought. If it's a, an old, uh, a hindrance would be, then be wanting something that we don't have, having to put up with an irritation that we have. Um, uh, uh, wondering about the practice. Is this the right way to practice would be doubt. Uh, restlessness and worry would be about the past and the future. What's happening in the past, what's happening in the future. So any past or future thoughts we can say would be automatically unwholesome as opposed to the wholesome thoughts of being happening right now. Yep. Okay. There's, a, there's also uh, the possibility that talking about the Dhamma, talking about the Buddha Dhamma is also very wholesome. That if you're sitting and thinking about the Dhamma, that's much more wholesome than thinking the thought. So let us say that we had a thought about that guy did me wrong and I've got to go straighten this out. Fair. OK, and if we let those thoughts go on, that's an unwholesome thought. But a wholesome thought would come along with saying, hey, I don't have to do that right now. But that is dukkha. The cause of the dukkha is because I wanted something from him that I didn't get. And now I still want something from him. OK, so we can see the hindrances in there. And this is now wholesome thinking. The wholesome thinking is to see the danger in the unwholesome. Right. Okay, so this is one of the ways of thinking also that is wholesome is, wow, I don't have to do that. Wow, I don't have to go there. I can avoid that place. And we can all, yeah, and we can also, when we do, we can congratulate ourselves. Wow, I didn't have to think about Billy Bob. I don't have to think about him right now. Right. I don't have to work myself up. And then if you eventually do need to deal with it, you can respond appropriately. Right, because we have all this backed up stuff. In fact, 
if we if we've got a plan when we go to to meet him, we may not be willing to listen to anything he has to say because look at all of this stuff I've got material prepared to dump on him. Right. We build a story. I build a story, right? Well, if we had if we stop building that story, then when we see him, he may have in fact forgotten about the argument. He may be really glad to see you. Why are you going to go stir it back up again? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that would be ideal. Uh, it's doable. I believe but you. We, but it takes memory. It takes sati. We have to remember to do this little investigation. That investigation, is this wholesome? Is it not wholesome? That's the noting technique, is we note, not this is it, but we note, is this dukkha? We note, is this wholesome? We note, is this a hindrance? Right. Okay. And, and you if, it, to- if it is a hindrance, if it is that, then we can, uh, the way that the Buddha himself handled it was, aha, I see you, Myra. Right. Okay, and that's a completely new thought. That's a Dhamma thought. That's a wholesome thought. Dukkha, 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 oh, I've got so much dukkha. That's one kind of unwholesome thought. But then you say, aha, I see you, dukkha. I, I got you. And now we're beginning also to change the attitude. Right. This is one's right effort. One's right effort is to see wrong view as wrong view and change it to right view. And then one's right thought, one's right effort, excuse me, is to change the thoughts that are associated with wrong view and to bring them into wholesome thoughts. And that's basically one's right effort. Also one's right effort is to breathe, to take those long, deep breaths, mindfully breathing in long and mindfully breathing out long while we are saying, hey, I don't have to think about that. Like, I see you, Mara. So you can see the Anapanasati in there, taking that deep breath. In fact, almost always an insight will come with an in-breath. But in fact, when I'm going down the road, I'm sitting there and Tam's driving and she'll say, what? And that's because I saw something. And when I saw something, I'll breathe in and she can hear it. (gasps) You've heard that how many billions of times? (gasps) All right. Yeah. Okay. So that in breath, noticing that in breath to be associated with the uh, with the insight of oh, I see you, Myra, or oh, I don't have to think about that. Yeah. And so we take that long, deep in breath, oh, and then we sigh and let it out. Oh, I'm glad I don't have to do that. So you could you could think of it like this is that that cow herd then whacking that cow with the stick is actually the taking of the in breath. And then having the cow move out of the way so that it doesn't step on that child or doesn't run into that uh, food cart is a relief. Wow, what a relief it is. We didn't go there. And that's the out breath. (sighs) That relief, that relaxation. And so start practicing with the breath. With the sense of letting go, relaxation, relinquishment with that out breath. This is different than what they call in Western Buddhism acceptance. I don't even know where that term came from. It's, it's like uh, you, you've heard the story of the lion that got a, uh, uh, a thorn in his paw, and I think it was a monkey or a rat or something. No, the rat chewed the ropes to get the, the lion free. Uh, the monkey took a thorn to pull the other thorn out. So the question would be, uh, if the lion has a thorn in his paw, should he accept that? <laughs> Depends on if he has any power to change it. 
Uh, yeah, I would imagine that um, the the lion would have the same power to change it that the dogs would have. Because I see the dogs around here chewing on their paws relentlessly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes. The, if we make the assumption that he could, then no, he doesn't have to accept that. Right, he doesn't have to accept it. And that uh, therein lies in that story also the technique of taking a little action in order to prevent large action. <clears throat> When the Buddha is teaching about the four kinds of kama, not just two, but four, in the last kind of kama, he says that this is the kama that leads to the end of kama. And that sounds confusing, doesn't it? The action that leads to the end of action. Well, here's a, an easy example of that is, is that you've got an entire freeway. Let us say a, a rush hour, uh, high speed traffic, everything is flowing. Um, and all the cops have to do is just to park a couple of cars sideways on the, uh, uh, in the highway and he can stop the entire traffic. All of those hundreds, thousands of people have to come to a stop just because the cops put two cars out there on the road. Okay. So that's an example of an action that will bring the end of action. Okay. okay. And so in this regard, the action that brings in the end of the action is, is to wake up and to recognize that these thoughts are unwholesome. And then to change them into wholesome is a small action as compared to having unwholesome thoughts one after the other for hours, days, weeks, giving yourself insomnia, uh, being tired, being restless, uh, being worried, uh, no patience, all of that kind of stuff right. is then all of that traffic that's out there that we can put a, a stop to with a small little action. That little action that we take is just to gladden the mind to say, hey, I don't have to think about that right now or use the term the Buddha did. Aha! <laughs> I see you. I see you, Mara. Because, in fact, what will happen with most students in the beginning, especially it happens, is that when they do have some sati, they do wake up and recognize that the mind has, for instance, wandered away from the breath. They will continue to have unwholesome thoughts like, oh, no, this meditation is so hard. Monkey mind, monkey mind, all oh, this is so tough. I don't think I'm ever going to get any value out of this meditation. Right? These are the I, kind of thoughts that people have. Yeah. Mine have been, um, I'm not sure if this is wholesome. I'm not sure if it's not. It seems okay, but I'm not sure. And there's, I'm glad you're okay. explaining it because it's making more sense to me. Okay, good. Uh, in fact, is this wholesome or is this not wholesome? This confusion, that's unwholesome. That's doubt. Yeah. Uh-huh. But always, thoughts of this present moment are wholesome. Also, thoughts about the Dhamma in this present moment are wholesome. Like looking at that un uh, unwholesome thought and saying, Aha, I see you. That's dukkha. That's the first noble truth. What's the cause of dukkha is the fact that while I was having those unwholesome thoughts, I wasn't aware of them. There's the ignorance. And those unwholesome thoughts also have wants and desires in them. And so I can see immediately that's the cause of this suffering is because I want something I don't have. And so we can say, wait a minute, I'm okay with what I do have right now. I'm, I'm satisfied. I'm, I'm all right. We take a deep breath and we immediately fall out of the second and the first noble truth into the third noble truth. Perhaps with the idea or with the thought of, wow, this is nice. Or we can go even to the point of, wow, this is third noble truth. Wow, this is really nice. No suffering right now. Okay. And so then we can, with our right um, investigation, we can investigate, like 
the Eightfold Noble Path, the points that we're uh, on about, and that is, is that how is my investigation? Am I able to investigate? How is my sati? Do I keep waking up? Do I practice, keep waking up? How is it? How is it going? How is it progressing? Uh-huh. How is my right effort? Am I taking the effort to throw unwholesome thoughts out when I catch them? Am I ha- do I have the right effort to take a deep breath whenever I remember it? So how is my sati? How is my effort? And then also in that investigation, how is my attitude? Am I on top of the world or am I buried under my own pile of crap? Okay, this actually leads to the story. I really like this when the student told me this. He says everyone is an emperor of their own pile of dirt. Yeah. Except that most emperors are buried under their pile of dirt. Or completely unaware of it. Right, exactly. And buried under it and completely unaware of it because they're completely surrounded by it. But the practice of Anapanasati is literally to get on top of it so that you really are the emperor on top of the world. Right. And it is not a struggle to come out from under it to be on top of it. That's one's right effort. When the effort is right, we just immediately come out from under it. Oh, that's an unwholesome thought. Or, aha, I see you, Myra. And that Myra used to be right on top of me. But now what is happening with that is that, aha, I see you, Myra. And we're drawing ourselves out of that thought. Before we were in it, we were that thought. But this new thought is, aha, I see you, Myra, is to pull us out. That brings us on top of the world. We're above the world now. We're above those negative thoughts. And so we become the emperor. We're on, we're on top of it now. This is Lokatara or uh, the super mundane is to pull out of it and get above it. Okay. And you can do that. I believe you. I, I do it. Yeah. I just don't do yeah. it all the time. <laughs> all right. Well, just get more practice and do it more often. Exactly. That's the way to practice is, is that as, min- as many times as often that you can. In fact, this is why sati is the most important skill. Why? Because if you don't remember to do this, you're not going to do it. It doesn't matter what skill you have. If you don't remember to apply that skill, then, okay, it, it's like uh, someone, let's use the example of uh, uh, tennis. And someone is training in tennis and their teacher is teaching them a new shot, perhaps the backhand or something like that. And they practice and they practice it. And, and and good at, and now they have a game. And just at this right point in time, that ball is way over there on the left side and it's time to go out there and do that backhand, right? Uh-huh. Can't do it, why? Because he, he forgets. Even though he's got the skill, he forgets to apply the skill. Okay. That's why sati is so valuable, is because we have to remember to wake up to begin to apply the skills that we have. And by uh, waking up and and remembering to apply the skill, then now we're building two skills. One is the skill, and two is to remember to apply the skill. So this is where sati comes first. If we can remember... To, to look at what we're doing, to remember to wake up and take a look. Is this thought wholesome? Is this thought not wholesome? Is this thought about the past? Because if this thought is wholesome, what that means is, is that it's free from hindrances. It's, a, it's an easy thought. It's uh, easy going. Everything is all right. No worries. No troubles. But you've been troubling yourself for a quite a long time yes and so it's a habit but you can uh interrupt that habit over and over and over again and so the unwholesome thought will come memory will come then we change it to a wholesome attitude change it to a wholesome thought take a deep breath and a minute later we're back into those unwholesome thoughts again 
Well, never mind. We did it one time. If I can. Now, here's the point. Would it have been better for me to have been in hindrance, stayed in hindrance, not ever taken a deep breath and, and remain in hindrance? So now that we're in hindrance for five minutes versus being in hindrance for, say, 30 minutes or a minute, waking up, being out of hindrance for four minutes and then forgetting and dropping back into hindrance. So which is better, two minutes of hindrance or five minutes of hindrance? Well, obviously the less. Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. Every time that we wake up is less hindrance. Every time we wake up and apply it, uh, we're we're developing the skill so that the next time we spend even less time in hindrance. So that pretty soon we get it to as soon as those unwholesome thoughts start to arise, we could catch them. Gotcha. And eventually it'll get to the point that you can just sit there with one wholesome thought after another, after another. And it's easy peasy. Now, there's no effort to it much because they're all wholesome thoughts. And I don't have to take the effort to throw it out. Just one wholesome thought after another, after another. And so we begin to practice this, to practice telling yourself or to practice to have intentionally the thoughts that you want to have. And so there's a whole vocabulary of, of nurturing wholesome thoughts that you could have. I just got a bunch of them, but I got I'm good on that. I, I mean, yeah, I'm good on that because I've had a lot of experience in the last year and a half with being extremely happy um, and being extremely grateful. And like gratitude is probably my go to. Uh huh. I like gratitude a lot. Yeah. Uh, you can hear the gratitude in the in the expression of, "Wow, this is so nice." Yeah, mm -hmm. they're just that's loaded down with gratitude. It's like, "Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you for coming out of those unwholesome thoughts." <laughs> yeah. Do you have a problem with me being like, uh, it, "Well, is this unwholesome for me to say, um, thank God for this," like? Not in the of God, but like, thank you, universe, for what is happening right now. Exactly. All right. Uh, do you know the uh, the phrase TGIF? Yeah, thank God it's Friday. Right. Okay. Right. Well, every day's Friday. All right. Fair enough. I, I'm getting it. Okay. Um, you could also say it this way, that every day is a holiday. Yeah. Everything is beautiful. Everything is perfect. There and was an old song out of a 1950s movie of Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. And <clears throat> I don't remember the movie's name, but they sang a song in there that I changed when I was a child. I changed the verbiage. And so when I've got ac internet access, I'm trying to get the lyrics that I remember instead of the actual lyrics. And I couldn't find a song, but I eventually did. The original lyrics to the song that they were singing was um, every street's a boulevard in old New York. But I would sing it differently. I would sing it every day's a holiday. <laughs> yep. And so that's the way that we it's a new attitude about life. Every day is a holiday. Everything's going to be all right. Right. These are the kind of nurturing thoughts, like today is a holiday. TGIF. Thank God today's Friday. And it's Friday afternoon to boot. <laughs> That's true. Today is going to be Friday. I wake yeah. up. To Come to think of it, it really is Friday, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's. <laughs> yeah, because be, it, Kitty it, didn't it, go to school this morning. <laughs> it'll be Friday here in. Uh, uh, 20 minutes so there's a 12 hour time difference between me and you so it's it's 11 37 a.m there right yes yeah so it's 11 37 p.m here and it's about to be saturday it's about to be friday 
If we're, we're about to be Friday and it's already noon. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, it is Friday. All right. Sorry about that. Kitty didn't go to school today, and I figured that it was Saturday. And it's Friday. <laughs> Never mind. It's a holiday. <laughs> but yeah, I was about to say, your analogy works. So uh, it's perfectly appropriate. So this is the way then we begin to practice all the time, whether you're laying in bed, whether you're driving the car, whether you're sitting in meditation. But we want to practice in meditation because the seclusion part is so valuable in the sense of getting away from all sensory input altogether so that we only have to deal with the unwholesome thoughts rather than new unwholesome stuff coming in all the time. So you're not necessarily talking about sitting on a cushion. You're just talking about a focused practice in seclusion. In seclusion, right. Getting away from it all, literally. And I don't care what posture you're in. Yeah. Okay. But if you had no furniture at all in your house, how would you sit? If you, if you didn't have that chair and the couch and the, and the bed and any of that furniture, and that was an absolutely bare, empty room, how would you sit? Probably wouldn't sit. I'd probably lay down. Um, I don't know. It depends on how long I'm sitting. <laughs> I've noticed, I've been to some retreats and stuff where if I sit for too long, it, it really starts to hurt. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Well, here's the point about that. Here in Asia and in tropical places, um, in my lifetime, here in Thailand, furniture is not the issue that it is in. You probably got more furniture in your room right there than we have in the entire house. Wow. Okay. And the Thai people, when they eat, they don't eat at a table. They eat on the floor. Why? Because the whole middle of the floor is enough room to where you can spread food out all over the place and people sit around it. And because um, in the West, I think it has to do with temperature and uh, coldness, because every two-year-old child is grabbed up off the floor and put into a high chair. I have never seen a chair, a high chair in Thailand. Right. They don't exist. Not only that, but the babies and, the, and young children sleep in the same bed with the parents. Kitty is eight years old. She still sleeps with us. Wow. Wow. That's the Thai system. So uh, the story then is of uh, my stepdaughter. I first met her when she was 11, and she's about 18 or 19 now. Finished. Uh, she's in university. And she sits when she eats in the full lotus position. The full lotus posture is how she eats. Wow. And all of these Westerners are lusting after this posture that this girl and all these Asian people are in is just a natural posture for them because they've been doing it their whole lives. Right. But in the West, we've been trained to, uh, to sit in, on chairs and on furniture. Now, this is so... Um, uh, let us say, pervasive in Western mentality that Bhikkhu Bodhi and the other translators of the suttas, I could, I could go look up the word, it wouldn't take much, is, is that the word they translated into cross-legged. In that very famous part where the Buddha says, go to a heap of straw or to the forest or to an empty hut or to a tree, and sit down cross-legged and bring the mindfulness to the fore, right? That's the standard thing that they say. Guess what? That word does not translate into cross-legged. There is no way you can get cross-legged out of that word in Pali. What is it? It actually will easily translate to the word couch or divan or chair or sitting appliance. It, be, it literally just means sitting, and it's the Western mentality that meditation has to be done cross-legged. <laughs> yeah, I, I've okay. always had a problem with that, the posture, because everyone's harps about it. Like, you got to sit like this. I'm like, what does that have to do with my mind? Well, 
It has to do with it in the sense that if your posture, if you're not sitting up straight, then uh, imagine it's like this. You can see the hand and the gravity is pulling, pulling the hand straight down. But if you have a hand like this, imagine that you had a very heavy weight like a, a, a head or a brain or something up here at the top and the posture is bent over. That's going to cause extra strain in the back. And we're remembering looking for ease. Right. And so sitting up straight is the easy way to sit. Sitting if you don't have any chairs or furniture to sit on. Right. Right. So sitting up straight is more, uh, especially if you're going to be there for a while. And I know a lot of monks who will have a very, very low table so that they can bring the low table and they can sit on the floor in their cross-legged position so that they can type on their laptop. <laughs> nice. Very typical of the monks, right. Tenisro, at least he's got a chair and a desk. <laughs> <laughs> so don't put so much into the actual posture but we take it in the sense of, number one, it needs to be stable. Number two, it needs to be comfortable. Because we're looking for comfort, we're looking for ease. The entire teaching of the Buddha is to come out of discomfort and dis-ease into a state of comfort and ease. And so we want to use the posture in that regard also. Okay. So... But we don't have to do it just at a particular time of day. A lot of students think that my meditation is all my meditation is from, you know, one hour a day. And the answer to that is all. That means that now you've been practicing hindrances and unwholesome thoughts for 15, 20 years, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And now you're going to take one day, one hour a day to practice having wholesome, leaving the other 23 hours a day with unwholesome, hindering thoughts. Which one's going to win out of that? Um, the first, well, the one that doesn't have the whole unwholesome thoughts. Un, like, that's a no-brainer. Uh, it's a, As a no-brainer, when you think of it like that, that means that at any occasion, whatever the mind is doing, we should keep track that it's not going to go off and step on something or break something or uh, get stuck in the mud something uh, in some stupid conversation. And so we want to take that right effort and uh, right sati to wake up, to uh, monitor to see what the mind is doing, and then if it's an unwholesome, to bring it back to the wholesome. I can meditate. That, that was one of the reasons why I contacted you. I was hoping you would make me meditate. So. <laughs> you didn't realize I'd be giving you that much meditation. <laughs> so you're saying an hour a day? If we, I mean, obviously. No, don't... I would actually rather see people practice in a different way rather than an hour a day. That in fact, the hour a day whole idea comes from the fact that many people, their mind won't settle down for the first 45 minutes. And so they spend 45 minutes uh, working and struggling, trying to get rid of the hindrances and don't. And then finally the mind gets tired and stops with it all. And then they think that that's meditation where, in fact, the mind is just really tired. That you probably heard many times and in many places that the human mind in general has about a 20 minute attention span. Uh, yes. And if we can really, really focus, we can do for an hour. And only really good experts can do it for two or three hours. Yep. Because I that's used why that in the, college to help me study. Right. So knowing that the attention span is short for the beginners, it's really a good idea for the student, instead of having one long sitting practice for an hour, is to break it up into four groups of 15 minutes each and do it 15 minutes at a time. 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes at lunch, 15 minutes when you come home, and then 15 minutes as you're going to bed would be a much, much better practice than taking a whole hour out and not getting as much, um, let us say, uh, mind moments of wholesome. 
that you will have a whole lot more mind moments of wholesome in four sessions of 15 minutes than you will have of one session that lasts an hour. All right. Because why? For one thing, the mind is fresh. Every time that you sit down for that 15 minute session, the mind will be fresh enough that you can actually practice for that first 15 minutes. Because you don't have to let the mind settle down. You're settling it down. Right. All right. Why? Because you're not just noting unwholesome thoughts as they begin to settle. You're beginning to watch a ho- an unwholesome thought. Say, Out you go. You're gone. Only wholesome thoughts here, boy. Okay. Now, when we're having these wholesome thoughts, we begin to feel wholesome also. This is the later practice that you and I will talk about later. But the first part is, is to get us in lines of where we know that the wholesome thoughts are the way to go. But basically what I'm getting at is, is that we have been spending our many lie, our many, many years um, practicing unwholesome or basically talking ourselves into feeling bad. Now it's time to talk ourselves into feeling good. This is what we're going for, is it not just the talking to ourselves with wholesome thoughts, but we're going to talk ourselves into actually feeling good. To feel secure, to feel safe, to feel comfortable, to feel like everything really is all right. And we become satisfied. And so next time when you call, we'll talk about this point about satisfaction, to get ourselves into a state of satisfaction so that we're comfortable and happy with and satisfied with what's happening in our own minds in this present moment. If you can get yourself into that state of satisfaction in uh, in your own mind, then we can go out into the world and deal with the world from a base of satisfaction. That's where that acceptance finally comes into play. If we say, oh, well, I've got to just accept the unwholesome thoughts in my mind, I'll never be able to get it to the point of being able to accept things in general. It's only by having wholesome thoughts. It's only wholesome thoughts can be accepted. Unwholesome thoughts are going to still be rejecting error how many times we've told, been told and tell ourselves we should accept it. We still don't like it because of the unwholesome. Yes. So this is the way to practice is, is that as you practice wholesome thoughts, you'll get yourself into a state of feeling very good. The word that in Pali is called sukha. Okay. <clears throat> which is exactly the opposite of dukkha. Dukkha is unsatisfactory, unwholesome, and sukha means everything is okay, everything is fine. No worries, no problems. No pain, okay. nothing to do, no place to go, and the spring comes and the grass grows by itself. So we need to cultivate moments like that, to continue to cultivate moments where everything really is all right. Because as we cultivate those moments where we have the thoughts of everything is all right, we actually begin to feel like everything is all right, and that's where we're really making progress. Right. All right. Well, let's finish this call now. Uh, do you have any questions or anything? No, I'll, I'll, I'll practice. And All I'll, right. I'll get back with you. Okay. Practice. Exactly right. Practice. That's the way to talk about it. <clears throat> practice to remember, to practice to uh, take right effort. Right. Yeah, I, I will. I will. Practice. Excellent, David. So, uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I hope that we've given you just enough of spark of imagination and uh, whatnot that you can go get her done. I'm not worried about getting it done, but that's not the problem. Um, but I will. I see where you're going with this. <laughs> I know. I, it's a, it, that was a joke or a play on words. Get her done here means stop doing anything. And now you've got her done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I didn't expect that from you. That's. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. That's clever. Um, David, I, it's good to see you again. I'm really glad that you're getting something out of this. Well, yeah, it's important to me. Um, I've had a radical shift in my and how I feel most of the time. And really the only time when it's not like that is when I'm like this. And I, the way I view it is the universe is giving me suffering so that I can get further along in my practice. No. Oh, okay. No. The universe cares not a whit about you. The, the universe is way too busy making sure that the cause-effect relationships keep rolling on. That's the job of the universe, is to make sure that causes actually create effects. That's its only job. Well, that would seem to imply that there's not a uh, benevolence to reality. Well, yes, there is, but you've got to add that up to you not the universe the universe has already given you all the benevolence is going to give you what is that it created you here you are you're part of the universe you're in you're on the inside you're an insider to the universe okay but everybody keeps feeling like that they're an outsider for some reason and yet here you are you're welcome the universe has invited you in. Here you are. What else do you want from the universe? I guess nothing. I, I, what you're <laughs> saying is completely contrary to what I believe. Um, so it, it may take me some time to accept that. Well, you don't see your beliefs don't matter. Okay, it's contrary to my I, experience. Well, it's, it's well, contrary to my experience that everything. Give yourself is fine. a new pardon. Go ahead. I missed you. Said it's contrary to my experience that everything is fine. Like, um, I I don't. Well, I guess you would call it magical thinking. Uh, to feel like, though I don't understand it, um, that there's purpose here, to whatever the hell this is, and. It, I guess I would call it faith. I have faith in whatever the hell this is. Whatever. F A T E or F I T H? F A T E. Uh, no, faith. sorry. F A I T H. Faith. I have faith. Faith, yes. Okay. I have faith in what is. That whatever the hell I'm going through, um, it's supposed to be that way. Uh. I don't know about the supposed to be. That sounds like rites, rules, and rituals. A better way of thinking about it is that's just how it is, not how it's supposed to be. How it's supposed to be is the way people want it to be, as opposed to how it just is. Okay. And that that. Uh, then would be back to that word that you used about acceptance. To accept that this is just how things are. This is it. You don't need any faith. You can see directly this is it. Okay. But people don't like it the way that it is. They want it better. They want to improve it. That means that they're dissatisfied with the way things are. Yeah, because there's a threat yeah. of, of evol evolving into something different, mm -hmm. which is desiring change. Mm -hmm. Desire, exactly. This is not good enough. I want it better than this. <sighs> That's a tricky one. Because <laughs> that goes well, so, so deep. Like, well, yes, and you can see also that that's a hindrance. Wanting things to be better than they are. Wanting the world to improve. Right. So the Democrats want the Republicans out, and the Republicans want the Democrats out. And everybody's unhappy. Yeah. Um, 
I'll, I'm going to end up mulling over that one, but uh, let me process and then we'll okay. talk about it again. All right. You I, can I'll, do that. Okay. I, I will right. call you again. I, like I told you before, I'm in this now. So great. So you do at least get to the point that wholesome is better than unwholesome. Oh, of course. Yes. And that wholesome also has the quality of being satisfied with the way things are. Satisfaction. And unwholesome means things aren't good enough and I want to improve it. I want make I want to make the world a better place. It ain't good enough. I mean, you just described me in a nutshell. Uh, the world is full of injustice, and I should fix that. Guess what? The world is not full of injustice. It's one's own mind is full of injustice. That's the world you live in. Probably. So, begin to see that those thoughts are unwholesome. That the world is is an unjust place and it needs justice. No, it's not. The world is just as just as it's always been. There are some people who can see what's going on and there are people who don't. Which group are you going to be in? Well, it's not not well. <laughs> it's tricky. I have a knowing that everything is fine all, yeah. the, all the time. Tap into that. Everything really and is fine. It, <laughs> Tap into that. But everything my, is my mind is like, no, can't. So, but no. this will help me with that. So I, I appreciate it. Um, I will practice <laughs> and I will probably suffer about what you just told me, but I'll, I'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Either way. Give me a call in a couple of days or next week or whenever you're ready, and we'll continue on with this. All right. That sounds fair. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I really it. like this conversation, Dave. This is good. I'm glad. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, so, but I, I'm going to let you go. I got It's midnight. Yeah. Thank you. Bless you. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.